it's a pleasure to be here. It, it is really an honor uh, to talk to you. And, and I'm, I'm not into presentations. I'm into just talking. Um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end of my presentation or discussion, and I would welcome very much your, um, your questions or comments. So I want to talk to you about Golder and our recent journey in the context of a longer journey that the company has been on since its inception. But first, I need to uh, give you a little bit of context about the industry that Golder belongs to. Um, I've had a long history in my career working with problematic situations in companies, and I've had a chance to study things. And I'm going to start off with some motivational uh, themes. Uh, it's always nice to get everybody's juices going. But I'm also going to in inject my own uh, interpretation of those motivations. So everybody's familiar with this, right? If, if at first you, you don't succeed, try, try again. Okay. If at first you don't succeed, failure may be your style. <clears throat> You know, again, you've, you've got to really frame this. Um, quitters never uh, win, and, and winners never quit, right? Right? Okay, very good. But those who never win and never quit are idiots. <laughs> what? Uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. Absolutely. Um, it's always darkest just before it goes pitch black. <laughs> All right? Now that we're in the right frame of mind, let's talk about our industry. Um, so Golder belongs to a very, very large industry, and it's called engineering and construction. Now, the world spends almost $4 trillion a year in, in infrastructure-related spending. Uh, and I'm not even going to start quantifying everything else that the world spends on everything else from uh, power and, and, and other commodities and food and everything else around you. So think of everything you feel, touch, and you can't see or even think about our industry touches. So within that industry, there's a sub-segment, which is the engineering and consulting world, and that's where Golder operates in. And it's, a, it's an industry that actually is quantified somewhere in the order of about a half a trillion dollars a year. So what is it? What does it take to be in this industry? So, we're a bunch of engineers and scientists, architects, every ologist you can imagine, geologist, biologist, ecologist. We're the nerds you used to make fun of at school. Now, we're wired quite similarly. In fact, one can say that we didn't choose to be in this industry. There was a gravitational pull that put us into this industry. And I'll take you back since the very, very beginning of civilization, where a rather curious or smart individual learned that they can kind of give advice about different things, and then they discovered they can make a living at it. That's the beginning. And when that person started to think about a business, it was secondary that the fact that they can make money they still just wanted to solve problems and innovate. That's your very first employee-owned model. And when they decided to bring others into the mix, hey, let's team up, let's have a, a business together, then it became an expanded employee ownership model. That's how it works. So our industry is very dispersed and highly fragmented and the majority of companies in our industry are actually privately held or employee-owned. Very, very large. And the fact that we get to make money while we do this wonderful thing that we do is really quite special. So just a little bit of backdrop again on the industry. Highly fragmented. We still see the small businesses. We call them the mom and pops. You know, one person, a couple of people, a small group, a handful, 50, 100. How about 100,000? 200,000 people. So the industry has been expanding. Those companies merge, and they, and they get bought out. And all of a sudden, we've seen other, other investors other interested parties come into the industry because they discovered something that was quite interesting. We're a very profitable industry. In fact, 
There's an organization in the U.S. called EFCG, and they do benchmarking for the industry, and they've tracked us for the last 30 years. And in the last 30 years, we've only had one year, and that was during the global financial crisis, where the industry didn't actually grow. It had flat revenue growth. Just one year. We've always been profitable. In fact, profitability has continued to increase year after year in the industry. So it attracted a lot of attention. So now we have big public companies, listed companies, that do what we do. We had banks buy into us, private equity firms, pension funds, even other industries, parallel industries that have come in and, and basically have bought in. And what does that do? Well, of course, it scrambles the employee ownership concept. So an interesting thing, we learned an interesting thing in the industry that as you grow bigger, you become less profitable. You grow less. You lose people more often. So the performance of companies going from small to big deteriorates. That's a fact. The performance of employee-owned companies outperform the performance of all other forms of ownership in our industry. Another fact. Consolidation has been going on with low interest rate environments and something called arbitrage, which I won't get into if you're a public company and you have a certain multiple that you trade at and you can just buy firms every day and generate paper money, essentially, on paper by continuing to buy those firms at lower multiples while you're valued at a higher multiple. That's driven the industry into significant consolidation. Then you hear about the 100,000, the 200,000 person firm. And that's kind of been disruptive. But society needs that to some extent. You need the large firms, the firms that can do soup to nuts. But there's always room in our industry for the small specialty firms. And what's happened is every time those large firms get so large, they start to fragment. And during that fragmentation, more new firms open up. And guess what? They get to start off as employee-owned. So it's an interesting phenomenon that even if you're not in our, in our industry, that I think you can learn something from. The firms are becoming more global in the industry. Even if you're a small player in a small market, you, when you follow your clients, you end up inevitably being global just by design. Organizations, as they get bigger, they tend to have a common uh, strategy. It's hard to differentiate now in terms of strategy. If you get so big, your strategy becomes narrower and narrower, and then ultimately it's really one statement. You know what it is? World domination, right? Big. I mean, the word big comes in. I want to be number one. I want to be the biggest, the largest, the whatever, more revenue. So why employee ownership? I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm not going to go over the virtues of employee ownership. All I can say is that it should drive significant differentiation. I'm not here to talk about the social context of this. I know and I've heard throughout just last night and today how important socially it is, but I'm actually going to talk to you from a capitalist pig standpoint. It is a strategic asset, actually, and I'm going to talk about that. It's all about engagement, isn't it? The difference between someone who participates and someone who commits, that's what it's about. And the best way, the best example that I use consistently, it's an old joke for me now, it's sort of like a ham and eggs breakfast. In a ham and eggs breakfast, the chicken participated, but the pig is committed. So you're all pigs. I didn't mean to insult, sorry. Um, so, let's talk about something called the puzzle. I call it the puzzle. I'm an engineer, I like to solve puzzles. So, over time, a significant number of employee-owned companies have lost partial or full control of their business as they have grown. That's just a fact. So, where do things go wrong? Oh, lots can go wrong. But where do things go wrong with any business? 
I'm going to hit just on a few things because it, it, it relates to my own company as I get more into detail here. So I own the company, therefore I should make, I should be involved in all the key decisions. True or false? False. Yes, you can make key decisions. You can elect a board. You can get the best executives amongst, from, from another employee, from one of our colleagues who owns the company as well, to be in charge. But don't call the CEO and tell them how to manage the balance sheet. That's not what you do. But the problem in my industry is that we're all very smart people, and as engineers and scientists, we can do anything. So having 50 hands on the steering wheel doesn't work. It's one of the biggest challenges. Where do other things go wrong? You get bigger, and then you realize, hey, what am I supposed to do? We're getting pretty big. I don't even know my partners anymore. So. Let's look at what other companies do. Aha, that's where it becomes a problem. Because when you start looking at those other companies, a lot of them, as they've gotten much, much bigger, have actually lost the connection with the whole employee-owned factor. So if you copy from a listed company, you're missing a few things. Now. A lot of things you can learn from, right? You can learn a lot of things about governance, you can learn a lot of things about strategy, but if you just start copying other companies, you miss the whole plot. Look, it's very simple. The most potent strength that happens with employee ownership, the strongest condition that you'll ever be in is, is that small group of people that started their own business with a drive and a focus and they build their own culture around that. And as they've grown bigger, it's downhill from there. The effort from that point on is how do you continue to scale that without losing the potency? And guess what? Everybody's in on that puzzle. Every single company out there that is growing to scale is trying to find a way to recapture, to get into that DNA and pull it so it can use it for its own purposes and leverage it going forward. In fact, even listed companies, big listed companies, are trying to create a synthetic version of employee ownership because they know how strong it is. So where do things go wrong? We lose connection to what gave us the strength in the first place. So my industry has a weight problem, scale. You get bigger, you got a problem. So now that I've framed things for you, um, let me tell you a little bit about Golder. Golder is one of the largest employee-owned companies in my, in my space. Now there are others, there are some really great ones out there, and we all have our different experiences. Golder is about roughly 6,500 people today. It's about a billion dollars in revenue. We have over 150 offices in just about 40 countries. And I discovered, I used to say we're on six continents, but I have a group of people counting penguins in Antarctica, so we count seven. We're 100% employee owned, but we're not smeared across the ownership spectrum. We have concentrated ownership and we have distributed ownership. So roughly 85% of our employees are full-time and 65% of full-time employees own shares. Anyone can own shares in the company. It's just that we choose to allow people to own more shares if they contribute more to the company. That's just the model that we've chosen. So we are a concentrated ownership in the sense that those principles, 6%, those senior owners that we have, own roughly about 52% of the company. The associates who are 9% of the, of the population, own about a quarter of the company. So that leaves about 20% of the company distributed across. So we were founded in 1960, and we are a global company. We're 100% employee owned, and we are specialized. So let me tell you about our journey. We've had a tremendous run. We've been around for almost 60 years. Now, again, capitalism speaking, 
in those 60 years, our average annual return to our employee owners has been 15%. That means we double your investment every five years. And in the last five, 10, 15, and 20 years, the average return to my employee owners has been 20%, which means you double your wealth within the company every three and a half years. So we are indeed capitalists. But there's more to it than that. In 2000, we started this absolutely torrid growth journey. You can say it almost happened to us, but we were so good, we are so good at what we do that just growth came naturally. So in 2000, we were 200 million in annual revenue and we grew 15 to 20% a year top line to the point where we were $1.4 billion in revenue in 2013. That's a lot of growth. Think about it. More employees coming in, more owners coming in. A lot of people coming in. So what happened during that time frame? Some underlying problems started to occur. The growth masked a lot of weaknesses. And the company didn't realize it until it was a little bit late. So what were some of those weaknesses? We started to disconnect from the, that core strength that we came from. We're still very passionate about employee ownership the whole way through, but there was a growing divide between the management of the business and the employee owners. In fact, the managers were all principals and associates from the employee owners, but when you became management, you almost became in a different category in the company. We created internal structures. There was one, one structure called the P&A Council, which was the idea of finding ways to communicate between the owners and the management, which were all employee owners. A little bit, a little bit messy here. We grew our overhead structure so much because it was so easy to grow that if you needed a floor in a building, get two because by next year you're going to need it. So we always had an overhead structure that was designed for a much bigger company than we ever were at any given time. And the funny part about this, painfully funny, that when we hit about $700 million in annual revenue, we stopped making more money. We actually kept growing the business and weren't any more profitable. So we became clumsy. We became clumsy. We got disconnected a little bit from the core strength that we came from. Recipe for problem. Wake up call. Mining sector, which was one of our biggest sectors that we work in, declined significantly in 2011-ish, 2012, but we didn't participate in that decline until 2014. It made us a little cocky when we saw that happening, and well, we didn't participate. I guess we're bulletproof. Keep on. Oil and gas decline. Uh-oh. Revenues are starting to come down. 30% decline in revenue. Now let me tell you about the heart of our company. We're one of the most compassionate, caring businesses out there. We do not like to let people go. When we saw our revenue decline by 30%, you know what the solution was? We held our breath and we prayed really hard and the most we can do was come up with a 5% reduction in our workforce. The company was going downhill fast. And in 2015, the company made this crazy, crazy decision to recruit a CEO from the outside and that's when I came into the picture. I was working for a listed company. My job in other locations, in other companies, were to fix problems. In fact, the job before this one, my predecessor was in jail. If you ever want to show somebody a tattoo or a scar, that's mine. But when a recruiter called me and said it was Golder, it was just instant attraction for me. I had seen I had I'd worked for companies like Golder early in my career, and they were acquired. 
And I had watched and seen the industry do its thing in consolidation. I was one of those participants. I bought companies. I integrated companies. But deep inside, I knew that our business doesn't really belong in the public space. We shouldn't be reporting quarterly. We should be looking at the long view. I was a closet employee ownership guy. And Golder was a chance. It was an opportunity for me to go in and say, hey, I'm from the future, and let me tell you which road not to take. But by the time I arrived, the company wasn't fully aware of its condition, and it took me about 30, 45 days to realize the mess that we were in. And then I felt really sad and then really angry. And then I had to communicate really clearly to people that were all hopeful and looking for me to come in and help guide them. And then the first thing I had to tell them is, guess what? We're going to have to cut costs. We're going to have to let people go. That was awful. And then I thought, no. If, I, if, I, if, if that's all we did, we just turn around and make more money and then, and then employee ownership could be dead. Because that was the time. If you, if you look at a tombstone for Golder, if you, if you went into a different future and looked at a tombstone, that was the time when Golder lost it. But no. So I talked to the owners of the company and I said, look, I'm not here to just make more money. I'm not here to turn Golder into something that looks like everything else. We are going to work together, and we're going to create a new future for ourselves. And first, I want to see your commitment to this. So we got together in an exercise. We called it Our Destination. I got in a hotel in a, in a, in a setting like this, and I brought 200 of our colleagues from across the company, and we locked ourselves up for a week. And we came up, and all I did was facilitate, by the way. I refused to vote. I was standing on a stage just like this, and I was coaching people into breakout sessions and go discuss and come back. And we came up with something that was absolutely brilliant. It was a long-term strategy that confirmed our commitment to employee ownership, that confirmed our commitment to be remaining a differentiated company, that outlined the future that for, for our company that was so inspiring. In fact, to the point where we sent it out we took a document, we sent it out to the entire company. I said, I want everybody to vote on this document. Everybody, from the receptionist to the senior engineer. Does this inspire you? Is this a good future for you? And we had like 97%. Joe, it was 97%, wasn't it? That basically said, I'm inspired, I'm for this. And then we went and cut costs. We had to let go of 1,400 of our colleagues. We cut about $160 million out of our cost structure. If we didn't, there would have been no company. We would have had to sell. But we came out of it with a future, aligned vision. We knew what we had to do was rough and tough, and we learned. That was the soul searching, restructured and soul searching. We also went back to the basics. I introduced a model, it's called a principle-led organization. We wanted to go back to putting more and more responsibility, more and more authority, more and more accountability to our employee owners to drive the business. And guess what? 2016, we had a full recovery. 2017 is on track to be a record year for our company. Most profitable ever. We're aligned. We know where we're going. We know who we are. And, and profitability, by the way, is not a bad thing. It is a license. It is a license to continue. So, when we were working on this, when we were putting this together, we wanted, to, 
really study this model that we call employee ownership for us. And we drew something out quite crudely on the back of a napkin, myself and a few people from our board. And this is kind of a cleaner version of it. And we discussed this at length. So what is the model? The model is finding a group, a core group of people that are exceptional in every way. Position and empower them to drive the business in every way. And then successfully and consistently transferring ownership from one generation to the next. It's simple. That's basically what it's about. So by positioning people into these different roles, your entire leadership are people with a stake in this thing, with skin in the game, pigs essentially. And having an operating model that relies on them, we create that differentiated position. Now, we had a meeting a year ago with just the principles of our company. And one of the discussions that we had was about what's called shareholder value. If you look it up, if you Google shareholder value, you get a whole bunch of stuff from, from the internet that talks about wealth, talks about money. We choose to define it differently. Yes, we are capitalists, we are interested in money, but we are also interested in other things. We've decided that we want to consistently invest in our communities through our philanthropic causes. We want to create and continue to have a great work environment for our people, and, and that requires some investment of time and money. And we want to invest in technical excellence and innovation, and that speaks to the scientists and engineers in us. And we're going to be disciplined about it, not random. So when we see the value that we've returned on our investment in the company, it is all of that. It is the financial return, and it is also the, those other non-financial factors that we talked about. So I leave you with one other bit of inspiration. Life is all about making mistakes and learning from them. But there's always the cynic in me. <laughs>